My name is Jason Miller, founder of Aspen Now Solutions, and we're about to unlock the power of ServiceNow. I'd like to start off by thanking all 3,545 subscribers in over 80 countries globally. If you believe in transferring knowledge to those who need it most, please click subscribe. Your user data will not be transferred to anyone outside of Aspen Now without your consent. Hey everyone, it's been a couple weeks since the last video, so I figured it's time to do another one. Just wanted to highlight this five new features in Paris. Uh, seems to be a hit. Everyone's liking it, watching it. Um, some cool content in there. So if you haven't got, had a chance to watch it, just go ahead and uh, click down there. And uh, today what we're going to be discussing is record producer tips, tricks, and scripts in Paris. And I've been doing record producers, oh, I think from the very beginning, which is a little bit over six years in service now and I figured you know what now it's finally time to share some knowledge with you guys regarding this topic and uh, first off let's start out with like what's a record producer so a record producer uh, you might think of like P Diddy or something like that um, no it's not a actual person the record producer uh, we're talking about a form that someone fills out to get something accomplished in the service now platform so um, this is generally done in the uh, service portal, which you're looking at right now. This is my service portal um, that I built out over time, and we're going to be focusing out, uh, focusing on this Aspen solution request. So I'm going to click on it. It's going to bring me into the form, and you'll see it kind of looks like your standard um, online shopping form, if you will. If you want to think about Amazon or something like that, when you're setting up your account, maybe you'll fill out your name, location, stuff like that, whatever. Um, this is going to be more for like a request. You could think of like incident, you know, so, something of that nature. So for our first, uh, let's see here, item that we're going to discuss, we're going to talk about preparing the table first. So this is a lot of people what they'll do is when they start out building um uh let's see here record producer they're going to come straight to the form uh and build out the record producer by going to record producers on the back end so if they go to um, rdpr um, they can come right here in a ser service catalog and they'll find record producers open up a new record and then they'll start building it and then they need to have like the back end so there needs to be a table that's built out but really i guess the the takeaway here is make sure you build out the table first with all the fields all the choices that are going to go into those choice fields or if it's referencing um you know another table and all that stuff work all that stuff out first and then what you're going to do is you're going to come into tables so if you type in here tables sure I spell it correctly let's go back one we'll come into tables I think I had it start somewhere it's like tables and columns might all the way be all the way at the bottom uh, there we go system it's under system definition and tables and that'll bring you in there and you can take a look at whichever table it is that you want once you click in the one that we're looking at I pulled up incident just for um, you know an example but if I want to look at this specific table um, this is Aspen RP table and when I click into the table again this is incident here um, <clears throat> when you come in you're gonna see like this columns and stuff it's a lot of stuff to scroll through especially if you have like you know 100 or so columns in here so it's 166 so what I'll do is I'll skip over here and what I want to focus in on is related links Right, and see down here this add to service catalog that's what you want to click on when the back end like all your columns and stuff are already set up and the reason why is because all you're gonna to have to do is once you click this you design the form and you move on from there um, there is a video on the channel uh, it's called how to create a record producer with a couple of clicks or something like that I can't remember the exact title but you go check that out it'll show you how to do that Second thing is like how to hide the information icon, so the reference data in the portal. So what do I mean by that? <clears throat> That's a great question. So a lot of times when we talk about a reference field, like the requester, right? It's coming from the user table. There's a little eye that appears here. 
and like for location also is going to location table so maybe we don't want the the user to be able to click in there and adjust the data um, so one way we can do that portal wide excuse me I'm kind of skipping around here is to come in out oh, great is to come to our portals right here so we're going to go to underneath service portal we're going to go to portals we'll find the portal this one's called aspen now and then down here in our css variables what you'll do is you're going to put in these i don't know five six lines of code um i'll let you do a screenshot or whatever it is right now hold for a second now what i'm going to do is i'm going to take these out right um, one thing I want to mention too, these this CSS variables slot right here is that you don't have to do it portal wide. You could do it based like you could do it in the widget if you want to um, add those lines and then it would have the same effect. What I'm going to do now is undo it so that way you can see what this looks like with the the eye or information icons in there. And my apologies, it's take a little bit for this to update today. So now I refresh this. And now pull this down. And you know it's always taken like it's taken forever when you see these three dots here kind of lining up. Um, probably because I just made that portal change. Uh, let's see here. So now you'll see the eyes populate. So again, this is something that if you don't want them to see this stuff, those are the lines of code that you would add right there, right? So if they click on the eye, they'll come in here and maybe they'll be able to edit some of the stuff. Maybe not. It just depends on the role that they have, right? But you generally, if you want to lock it down, um, that's the way you would do it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reinsert those six lines of code or so in here and I'll click save and then we can move on to the next one. So the next topic that we're going to talk about is uh, variable default um, and on change client script as a combination to do dynamic data. So the requirement would kind of come from your customers like this that when the screen loads um, they want to be able to see their information populated in here and then they want the location coming from the user's profile they want the phone number coming from the user's profile and then they want the Instagram coming from the user's profile which sounds great so a lot of people what they'll do is they'll go in there and create an onload client script but you really don't have to do that um, what I like to do is just do the variable defaults so I pulled up uh, the variables here which have those defaults in them and I wanted to show you the default values um, I think I can do this request for one real quick just looking at it here and that you'll see that out of the box service now has um, basically these functions that say hey go get the user ID this one here um, for the location and maybe I can just scroll through yeah so here's our requester saying hey go get the user ID and display it this one here is notice the reference here for location right so we're referring to the location table however here what we're saying is look get the user and then get the location field from the user's profile right so just note that it's getting it from the user's profile and the same thing here with the phone number we'll do phone and all that and I know your next question is going to be like hey can we do this with a custom field sure uh, right here you'll see and notice the subtle difference here that we don't have get display value we have just get value and then I put in u underscore Instagram and it's and the Instagram is pulling this information from my profile and then the next one was for the date and time uh, we want to have the current date and time so basically whenever this thing loads it's gonna um, in that date field it's gonna have the current date and time so all those all that information is coming from at least these four right here are coming from my profile and this one's just pulling from the system every time uh, this screen loads again it'll come up with the current date and time so then at this point we want to make it dynamic and when i say dynamic we go back to our 
front end form before I go to script. Sorry, I was jumping ahead there. Let's say uh, when I say dynamic boot, when I change the user, I want this information here to change. We'll notice he doesn't have an Instagram in his profile, so that changed also. And the point of that is sometimes you're going to have forms where people can request on behalf of another person. Right on load, the requester matched what was here, right? Basically, the person looking at it. But sometimes you'll find they want to have the requester or they want to have a requested for and a requested by or an open by and open for, whatever. They're going to have hours of discussion on how to name it, what should display, if it's intuitive to the user, whatever, blah, blah, blah. The main point is that if they ask you to populate it with the person who's looking at this screen, that's the way you would do it using the default value. Later on, if we want to change it, we're going to create an on-change client script. Everything is running off of the Aspen requester in this example. All right, so we have our catalog item here, request. We have a requester. And then if we want to apply it to the target record, we can do that too. So after it's created and it goes to the backend table, um, it would work there too. One other thing to note, you might have this selected like desktop. It's not going to work in the portal that way. You want to have either this one or all selected for this to work. So then we have our standard function on change, blah, blah, blah going on here. Here's one of the money lines right here. Notice line five. We create a variable called rec. Then we're saying on the form dot not get value, but get reference. You get the reference of Aspen requester, right? That's the variable name that we care about. And then we have this set phone here, right? Notice that we have our function set phone right here. And then we have the rec, meaning the variable. See this little mapping right here? You can kind of draw a crisscross on the mapping to it, um, to these two. And just make sure in the right places, because later on you might want to use this and change the names. Hey, perfectly fine, right? Um, then we're going to go ahead, set our value. We're going to set the phone, right? So our phone variable to whatever is in the sys user profile for Aspen requester. So this req, req is right here, right? So we're saying, okay, whatever's coming from this profile, I want the phone to go in the phone slot. Then with the location variable, we want whatever's in the location field in the user's profile. And then notice here we have you Instagram and our REQ dot you Instagram. So those are the three fields that we're setting from the user's profile every time that thing changes. Um, moving on, let's talk about variable attributes and displaying uh, reference data. So we already went, we already had that customer requirement to get rid of these little eyes here, right? Now, then maybe the customer will come to you later and say, well, look, I want to be able to display um, the person's phone number and their address because there could be a million Jason Millers in here, right? So if I type in Jason Miller, uh, maybe there's maybe one Jason Miami Miller, but maybe there's a couple that appear like Jason Miller. So I want to get the one with the correct um, phone number and address. So we have to bring in uh, the information from the sys user table and maybe even they want to be able to look it up via their Instagram too. So I don't think we have that covered here, but maybe I can show you how to do it right now. So in order to, and we'll focus in on the requester variable. So we'll go to our variables. Um, and then we'll come into the variable here. We'll notice our variable attributes. So these are kind of cool. You can also go to ServiceNow documentation, take a look at some of this stuff. Um, this document, this page right here, you know, if you're on from ServiceNow and you're watching it, I will say one thing, it's kind of confusing. And the reason I say that is that like, it tells you the variable type down here on the third line. So you kind of get all excited, like, ooh, a lot of extensions. Okay, but what can I use that with? Well, attachment. So you have to go through all one of the, like if I were to do this, I would have like columns set up to say, okay, here are the ones that go to the reference field. Um, so I'd have like, you know, variable type reference and then I would go on down the line. And then if I want to refer to some of these diagrams, I would just see, be like, see, you know, whatever it is, diagram one or whatever below. Um, and also like this is searchable one. Um, you'll notice here, note, um, 
not applicable in service portal so that's one thing to look out for too that's why i don't kind of like this you know the way this document i love the content i just don't like the way it's arranged um so let's take a look at our attributes here so the attribute that we're going to use is ref ac columns right so we already saw we had phone and location in there so now we want to do you instagram and i'm going to add that i'm going to click save it'll take a couple of seconds uh for for this to, to line up also and uh or to load up excuse me you can see right here it's still loading and what we'll do is we'll go to the front end now and refresh here and we'll see if at aspen now appears in the drop down so that way i can look it up that way too because that might be the most unique identifier of them all or maybe phone number i don't know like i guess some people can have multiple instagrams but changing your phone number man i feel like no one ever does that um so let's go here i'm going to change it to able and then what i'm going to do now is i'm going to change it or i'm going to try to go by aspen now as you can see here boom it pops up right and then it changes everything here so beautiful we can look up that user that way too so just remember that um for that go into type specification and then down here all the way at the bottom you're going to see here then you can put in ref ac columns equal and that's just one of the examples there's some other attributes out there i don't want to go too much in, in depth but i feel like that's the one i most commonly use um, especially when it's in conjunction with knocking out those information um, uh, variable excuse me icons within the platform now here's a little trick that i like to to do is ca it's called leveraging variable order so you probably understand how the variables are sequenced so with this order uh, column right here and we kind of put an order via number um, you know 10 20 whatever it is 100 just space them apart that way what I like to do is for like the containers especially I don't know why but it seems like I'm always searching for like the container split and the container start and then I also want to figure out like where like the variables are in relation to these two so what i'll do is all the container ones i'll end them with a seven 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 down here now you're probably saying like look you could probably um you know just type in container or whatever and that'll bring up those four or five whatever that's fine but i need to see the variables also that's kind of like the other ones that are non-containers too, just to see how they line up. So just like a quick scan, like using um, just, you know, the, the order here, I can just make the trailing one a seven and it makes it a lot easier for me. Seven, seven down there. So I like that little trick to use sometimes. All right, so then how do we filter our variable values? Now, as you know that um, there are no real like dependent fields like we have on the back ends um with uh you know our regular table stuff so if we have a category subcategory set up like this and you'll notice i did two and you probably thought to yourselves like is this guy drinking too much coffee this morning or what he doesn't need two categories subcategory why is he doing that the reason why is i want to show you two different ways you can set it up um which hopefully will help you out so if we go into um our variables here um we'll see that we have a bunch and the ones that I wanted to focus in are those, those four that I talked about, the category subcat. So this one, and I, I don't think they recommend this, but I know a lot of people do it. They'll try to go straight to the sys choice table. Okay, fine. You, you want to go to the sys choice table and try to pull out like six categories for, you know, this custom table you built, or let's say you even had 20 categories for incident or 30 or 40. But, you know, that choice table has a lot of stuff going on with it. I just feel like they, the reason why they tell you not to use it is because it's going to hamper performance. But if you do, then fine. Okay, so look up our value. Our, we're looking up the label, and then I create an advanced ref qual here. Notice we started out with JavaScript colon, and then I'm saying the name is incident. So name means the table, because on the choice table, it has a listed as table, but really the, um, the value is name saying if it equals incident and 
inactive is false, and domain is global, and then the element is category, then display the stuff, right? So basically all this stuff has to be met. So, and that's for the, the variable that's called category. So if we go look at it on the front end, um, it's gonna pull all the ones there for incident. You know, we can, we can check if we want to and see if that's true. I don't think we have to waste a lot of time doing that though, but um, I think the main point is just to show you how the filtering part, right? Because you're more interested about the subcategory. You're probably like, look, dude, I already know how to do that for first part. Fine. You want to do the second part? Because, you know, the first part you could probably do with just regular. You don't need an advanced ref ball. The second one that is my go-to, and let me scroll in just a little bit so that way you can see it a little better. So if, now I'm going to say here, this one to me has been critical. I like to say if it's not empty, then, and we'll notice we have this in parentheses here. So we're doing an if statement. If, if current dot variables, I mean the variable on the form is not empty, then we're going to say the dependent value. Now where's dependent value coming from? That's not on the form. It's this choice table, right? That's where it's coming from. Because there's a column or a field, however we want to refer to these as, on the sys choice table called dependent value. Dependent value has to be equal to that category for it to, to display. Now you'll notice here, I'm not telling it has to be an incident subcat. I'm letting the other filter do all the, the leveraging of that part, right? Because here I'm saying it has to be incident. Here, all I'm telling it in the if statement is that, look, you, the category, you only have to do the filtering when um, it's basically um, not empty. So yeah, if someone were to go in and try to do the subcat first, is that gonna be pretty? No, nah, it's probably not gonna be pretty because again, there's like, you know, all these subcats in there. And you know, someone might get angry and be like, you know, why, why can they see all this stuff? You know, the, like, like I said, this isn't a good way to do it, right? And I think that's the way um, they tell you, you know, you shouldn't be doing off this choice table. Notice here when I change it to business rule, it clears all this stuff out. We only have one for business rule. So let's let's take a look at the other way to do it. So if we take a look here, this is our variable called JM category. And now the table that I'm looking at is not this choice. What I'm looking at is the assignment data lookup table and the category is listed there. So notice here, I don't have to put any variable attributes in because when we go to this table, we'll see that <clears throat> here's our assignment data lookup table. Um, you'll see here is DL underscore U, and you can create these these custom too. Like so, if you have like your own record producer for a custom table or whatever, you can create your own data lookup. You just have to extend that DL table. Uh, I believe is the way to do it. I think there's also a video that I had one of my guest stars do on setting up like data lookups. So you can go check that out too if you don't want to set one of these up. But look here, we have two categories that are business rule. One is email, one is Mac. So basically what we're saying is that when business rule is selected on the front end, we just want to see email or Mac. Now let's see if that's true. So we're gonna come down here. We're gonna select business rule, email or Mac, perfect. Now how did we get there? Let's go take a look at our subcategory uh, because that's gonna tell us um, you know what's what's in the secret sauce here so again I have an if statement going on saying look if JM category meaning that other field right is not empty then I want category and where's category coming from right here to equal the same thing as the JM category variable right so uh, one thing I would recommend is if you're gonna be doing a lot of filtering or a lot of stuff on the front end um, and you're gonna have these category subcategory filters I would try to write this somewhere on a piece of paper and memorize it this construct here just remember this though right here this part this is always coming from the, the from the table so just want to kind of hammer that home okay so now we can go ahead and show you a little trick here too so I think we can use yeah, I want to do this one here. So like, let's say we don't know anything about um, creating advanced ref qualifiers and how to do all that stuff. If you have a simple one set up, 
What you can do is in, in this one here, this Aspen Requester, it's using a simple ref qualifier. Name is not empty, active is true, fine. If you don't know how to do it, just change this from, now this is after you save it with these values in there, okay? So I don't want you to come in here, create a couple of filters without saving it and then change to advanced and then nothing happens. But if we change this to advanced, we'll see right here, it gives you the ref qualifier right there. So all you would have to do is do JavaScript colon, whatever, throw that in there and you can use that elsewhere. So that's kind of like one of the tricks that you can do. You could probably do it, you know, you might be able to do it on the back end. The key is going to be later on with like your if statements and all that type of stuff. That's where it gets complicated with these ref qualifiers. And if you were to ask me like what the most complicated part of the platform is for um, maybe everyone, but especially novices, is this ref qual like doing advanced ref quals. I feel like that's the hardest part, but that's just my opinion. Okay, so we talked about leveraging variable order. Um, we did that. I thought there was one more in here. Did I do the CLVC acronym? Maybe that's going to be okay. So, sorry, I'm going to go ahead and put this in. No, I didn't want that presenter mode. Yeah, that's fine. Sorry about that. I was rearranging slides earlier. Okay, so container end break line container start so I want you to remember that and I think it's actually um, better illustrated if I take a look and it's actually label so sorry about that I'll need to correct that <laughs> maybe I did and I just forgot to change it but so what we're trying to do here with this acronym is get a good way good methodology you see how this section break right here occurs Watch what happens when I change this request urgency to critical, which I'm going to do in a little bit. See this new section label? How it kind of confines to its own section. It looks nice like that. Whenever you want to create new labels um, in a new section, always think about that acronym. So that's that's one thing that always comes into my head is CBLC. So I mean, in container end, break, uh, then what is it? Label, then container start. So in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix that right now. So that way we can remember that for later. Sorry about that. Okay. So yeah, that, that, uh, requirement always, uh, seems to pop up from customers where they'll ask me like, well, can't you break this out into a new section? Um, yeah, that's the way you would do it. And a lot of times that's what the deal is with customers. They're more, I'm concerned with the aesthetics and the appearance of the form rather than the data they're getting out of it. So let's talk about some UI policies here to set value. Um, I want to talk about one calling thinking backwards and then another one to validate a date. And yes, this is all being done via UI policy. So you can also equate these UI policies to on change client scripts. Um, there might be some parallel examples that we could draw from that. <clears throat> So our first one that we're going to look at is uh, the mandatory fields one, which you probably know, all novices know this, no conditions. We're just going to plop our uh, variables in there and then we're going to create a, a, just a mandatory um, is true condition right there on our UI policy actions. Um, now let's take a look at, and you know, you're probably like, I've already seen that before. Reason I look, uh, the reason I point that is that you're going to see some without any UI policy actions in them coming up. You're probably going to be like, well, how does this, how does this do that? So notice here we have date one before day two. We're going to have a kick out an error. So let's go over to our record producer here. And now let's say if I do day two on September 1st, it clears both of them out <clears throat> and it comes up with that message. Now you're probably like, well, I've never seen a UI policy do that before. So let's take a look at our construct here, right? Our conditions. Day two is more than zero hours before date one, right? That's all it is. We're gonna use our script. Yeah, this, this tab I feel like is very, very underutilized. See this run scripts box? 
See, when you come in here, it's gonna be like that. You're gonna check that box. And then again, with that UI type I was showing you for the change script, same thing. Desktop, mobile, you probably wanna go with all, right, just to cover yourself. And then right here, what do we got? Pretty simple statements. G form, set value, day one. So clear it out, day two, clear it out. Then we're gonna do a show, show field message, day one. Day one must be before day two. So that's where we got that from. Now we'll notice here there's an execute if false. I'm not gonna put anything in that box. The reason why is because we'll see here I have this reverse of false is there. So I don't really want it doing anything. I only want this to occur when this condition is met and that's it. I don't care about the reverse of it. If the reverse of it happens, I want everything to flow normally. I don't want any, any message to pop up to the user. I want them to go about their business and fill out that form. So next one is gonna be for COVID-19. <clears throat> so if the category is COVID-19, again, no UI policy actions. We have a script here. All we want to do is change it to critical, the request urgency, right? So gform.setValue, here's our field, excuse me, our variable name, and then here's what we want it to put in there out of our, our choices. So let's go test it out. Uh, in fact, I want to reload the form. And you know, you're always going to have those one-off situations where they're like, they're going to give you a list of all these, um, you know, categories or everything. I say, well, for that one right there, we want the urgency to go up on the form, you know, and that is even if you like let the users pick their own urgency, because a lot of times um, they don't. They're like, look, if you're filling out this form, we don't think that it's critical if you have time to fill out this form. The only critical ones are the ones that come to us via call, meaning the phone. So uh, I think it was this category is COVID-19. And we'll see if it sets it. No, it's not that one. Let's try this one. Yay. So is this one here a jam category? Request urgency is critical. Watch what else happened. See this critical urgency description pops up? We're going to save that for just a second. Um, so that's going to be our next one. So again, here's a review of our COVID-19 one, if you, in case you didn't catch that script. And again, I don't have anything down here in the executor false. If it's not COVID-19, guess what? Let them pick their request urgency or whatever it is. So for here, this is our next one, critical urgency. <clears throat> I did this one backwards. So when I go back to this slide, think backwards. Think in terms of is not. MVC, so mandatory, visible, and clear. False, false, true. Let's go take a look at this. So if the requirement comes to me and they say, hey, Jason, I want it so that if when it's critical, I want the box to pop up at the bottom and I want it to be mandatory. What I do is I create one that is the opposite of it. So that way I can clear the box, meaning the um, the item that they wish to appear in case they reverse it. And the reason I do that is because there have been several times where I've gotten this and we can take a look at this clear the variable value. So here's the construct, right? We're saying here is the opposite of what they want, right? So if they're saying when it is critical, we want it to appear, we want it to be mandatory, um, then we would set it up as it is not whatever they want. And then we're going to say mandatory is false, visible is false, and then clear the variable value. The reason why I'm clearing it and on load, it's not going to matter, right? When you first load up your page, who cares? But like, let's say they put in JM and then later they change their mind. Well, I don't want that urgency description to go through to the record producer. What I want is for it to clear out, which it just did. So if we run through that again, <clears throat> I'm just going to change it to critical. So on load, nothing's going to be in there. No big deal. Then we're going to change it to critical and we're going to see what happens when it's critical. That box will pop up. At that point, I'm going to fill it in, change it back to standard. So here we go, the critical. This pops up. 
Now let's just pretend that this was some sort of um, reference to either an individual or a group that was an approver. And then this box was something a little bit different. Um, I had that scenario too. That's why I would have it clear out is because maybe there was another box that was supposed to pop up to determine the approver too. And I think I had one that had like seven or so and it, it could only be one of those seven. So I had to have it clear out just in case they changed their minds like that. So that way when they go back in, there's nothing there. And going back to that example, I was using that real life um, experience that I had or a customer requirement. Um, it could have fired off two approvals if I didn't have it clear that first one. So that's what I'm saving myself from there. And I think we covered all three of them. So moving on. Last thing I want to talk about is leveraging the record producer script instead of the business rules. So one thing I feel like um, a lot of individuals probably neglect is right here is a script. And we'll notice here we have uh, we're setting the state to open, right, or the integer value because state is an integer. And then we're setting the contact type to service portal. These aren't things that we want the user to do when they're filling out the form, right? So that's why we're doing it here in the script. So when they hit submit, it's automatically going to open up the record. It's our, the state is going to be open. The contact type will be service portal. Sometimes people will try to do this via business rule. I just don't feel like um, that's something you want to do, like stacking up all these different business rules because later on, maybe you don't condition them properly or whatever this ensures that it's coming from the record producer when you're doing the script in here um, because you could have multiple methods for opening up these aspen request records so there could be phone and email and stuff like that uh, so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to send one of these through i don't know do none actually let's change this one to business rule We'll change this to business rule just to satisfy the mandatory requirements. I'm going to hit submit. And it's going to come up with a number here. And then I'm going to go to my requests. All right. And let's just see if it opened up correctly. So we'll come in here. And I thought it said 111. But yeah, it looks like contact type is service portal, beautiful, and state is open. So it set it exactly the way we want to. And also the user wasn't tasked with doing that, which was pretty awesome. So just to review today, you know, here's a couple of our tips, tips, tricks, and scripts. Try saying that a hundred times um, that we went over. Prepare our table first. Make sure our back end is good to go. Hide that information icon if we don't want our users messing around with those with those uh, fields that are in the reference data. Don't forget that default and on change client script combo um, that can help us out instead of on load client scripts. We have our variable attributes that we talked about. Don't forget to leverage that variable order. Um, that was one of our tricks. And that advanced ref qualifier, flipping it back and forth once you have it saved from simple to advanced will give us the ref qualifier. Don't forget that CBLC for the section breaks in case you need to create a new section. Uh, and then we have our UI policies. And some of these actually acted like on change client scripts, which, which was kind of cool. And then we have our record producer script, which we just talked about. If you like what you saw, go ahead and click like, please. My name is Jason Miller, founder of Aspen Now Solutions, and we've just unlocked the power of ServiceNow.